I have covered the electrical nature of stars many times before. In fact, I have actually produced a mini-series looking at the conventional and then the electric model and outlining how star evolution is not what it seems. We've talked about red giants, about normal stars, abnormal ones, pulsars, neutron stars, but all as separate discussions. So I felt it was high time to produce something that outlines how stars potentially are born, how they change from one type to another, and then how potentially they might die all within an electric universe. So let's start with a stellar Birkeland current, which potentially crosses another magnetic field or some other interaction causes the pinching effect. This would draw in more current and plasma from the surrounding area and increase the current density through the central area significantly, compressing the central area into a plasmoid. Through Markland convection, the chemical elements are separated radially. They will cause the helium to move to the outer layer then hydrogen, then oxygen and nitrogen, with iron, silicon and magnesium in the inner layers. In this model, the core of the star would end up being composed of heavier elements, but the exact structure at this stage is not important. This plasma forms the star itself. The strong electrical and magnetic fields created in this pinch will set up the stellar circuit. Plasma will naturally create a sheath, separating itself from the surrounding environment. We see this around the Sun in the form of double layers and we see this in the much larger scale heliopause, which separates the stellar from the interstellar medium. The heliopause supplies a slow but steady inflow of electrons to the central star, and conversely the star produces ions which stream away from the star towards the heliopause. So initially, the majority of that central pinch will be very bright, and it will then fall back depending on the current density in its surrounding area. Here it is important to realise that this environment is not static but changes. These changes have an impact on how the star appears and behaves. So stars born through this process are born as bright and blue stars with very high current densities, and this will be surrounded by what appears like a planetary nebula, often in what looks like an hourglass shape. Over time, the excitation in the surrounding plasma, far from the star, will recede, causing it to go from glow mode back into dark mode. The photosphere is acting like a positively charged electrode in a galactic discharge. The red chromosphere is the counterpart to the glow above the anode surface in a discharge tube. On the photosphere, the tufts are a mechanism to allow the star to regulate this incoming current. Consider them like a sort of buffer, allowing them to absorb changes in the external environment without impacting the output of the star to a certain extent. Assuming that this stellar Birkeland current is part of a larger structure which comprises the whole galactic arm, it is easy to see that the current flowing through the arm varies depending on what position you are at. It may also be possible that the stars themselves wander within their filament, moving away from the creation pinch causing it to receive a lower current density than before. So let's imagine that this star wanders further away from the original pinch point and now receives a lower current density, let's say equivalent to our sun. The star is now less electrically stressed, the tufts on the photosphere will be smaller and emit less energy. Consequently, the light emitted will move from the bluer colour to a more white-yellow colour. The tufts will change to attempt to react to any changes in the incoming current. Conversely, the solar wind will show these changes more readily, meaning that although the output of light from the star does not change, there can be a large variation in the solar wind due to the changes in the incoming current. If the star continues to move further away from the pinch, or its location in that structure causes the current density to drop even further, the tufts will become less pronounced and cause the photosphere to start shrinking. The output is greatly reduced, but the star remains hot. Effectively, the white discharge of the corona reaches down to the photosphere. The star has a preference to generating X-rays as compared to visible light. 
they now appear as white dwarfs. If we reduce the current even further, now the tufts are unable to produce the white glow and can only produce a faint red glow. These are what we call red dwarfs. Continue reducing this even further and we end up with a star that hardly shines at all. These are your brown dwarfs. If for some reason the current is removed altogether, there would be no more electrical activity and what was once a star would now appear as a gas giant. A star's functioning requires electrons to flow towards the star. If this process is interrupted by, for example, a large dust cloud or a large cloud of non-ionized gas, these dust and gas clouds will tend to absorb the electrons slowly flowing inwards, blocking the star from receiving them. When this happens, the star's plasma sheath will start to expand in an attempt to increase the surface area over which electrons can be captured. As this happens, the star will start to dim significantly and become larger. As more electrons are captured by this expanding sheath, it will cause an increase in the electric field, and this will cause more ionization to occur, and this in turn causes the plasma sheath to start glowing faintly red. This is what we call a super red giant. The increased electrical field will also cause a huge outflow of positive ions away from the star, creating large stellar winds compared to other stars. While the inflowing electron current is blocked, the star is not able to easily manage changes to the incoming current, and any change will necessitate a change in the surface area. An increased current will tend to cause a star to shrink. A decrease would see the surface expand. Any change to the gas surrounding the star would cause the electron absorption to increase, which could force the star to expand and cause it to dim. So changes to the environment and changes to the incoming current cause not only changes to the brightness of the star, but also alter the size of the star itself. Whenever the current density increases rapidly, a star has a number of mechanisms to attempt to balance this. Firstly, it may shed large amounts of charged material, which we would see as a corona mass ejection, or CME. If the electrical stresses are so high, the star might fission. Here the star may end up splitting or ejecting matter outwards, creating a companion. A star also has an electromagnetic energy store in an equatorial current ring. Matter is ejected equatorially by discharges between the current ring and the star. If this stored energy reaches a critical point, this may be released in a bipolar discharge or ejection of matter along the rotation axis. The remnants of SN1987A show exactly this. This is what we would see as a star nova, where it sheds a large amount of material but remains otherwise functional as a star, or a supernova where a large amount of material is ejected. What is left behind is what is often referred to as a neutron star or a pulsar. Peratt and Healy wrote a paper on the radiation properties of pulsars, magnetospheres, observations, theory, and experiment, and they concluded the sources of radiation energy may not be contained within the pulsar, but may instead derive either from the pulsar's interaction with its environment or by energy delivered by an external circuit. Our results support the planetary magnetosphere view, where the extent of the magnetosphere not emission points on a rotating surface, determine the pulsar's emissions. This means that what is left behind is the star, but that it undergoes periodic discharges, creating the pulsing. This is like a broken circuit. The event disrupts the surrounding environment, causing this very periodic discharge. In some sense, this is one type of death for a star. It no longer functions as it did. The majority of the material surrounding it has been blown off, and this event, if large enough, may have disrupted the inflowing current and blocked it completely. So at the end of the day, what is left behind? Potentially, it's just a core, which may well resemble a rocky body. Some stars may end up being ejected at high speed out of filaments, and when they exit the filament, they will no longer receive an incoming current. And this would mean that they would suddenly turn off. Now the question is, 
what would happen as they approach the edge of the filament. If we assume a complex bezel function filament, stars on the outer edge of the filament would have a lower relative field strength compared to those at the centre. And this would mean that stars towards the centre would appear bluer and stars on the outer edge would appear redder. So if a star were to be pushed outwards in a filament, then its field strength would slowly start to drop off, causing the star to start to appear redder in colour. Once it leaves the filament altogether, it would simply turn off. Now depending on the state the star was in, it would either leave a rocky body in the event of a supernova explosion. If it was a red giant, then it would leave a rocky body surrounded by a cloud of gas, in other words a gas giant. And if it formed from a star which was in a super red giant phase, so its electrical gathering ability was inhibited, then we know that these types of stars have a great abundance of water in their atmosphere. They would form a water gas giant, like Neptune. And this may explain the vanishing stars that I have covered recently. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.